Hi guys, Mark from Dynamics Hobby again. Uh, today I'm going to demonstrate how to perform a two-plane balance with our impulse balancing system and a new cradle that we've designed. Uh, this cradle is actually manufactured from 6061 aluminium. It's a very solid cradle. Um, it works very well for this kind of application. Um, so we'll go through that today. Um, so just to give you an overview of the setup, we have um, a rotor, a two-plane rotor which is uh, essentially like a, a dumbbell arrangement. And um, we have a, um, a motor drive mechanism to spin the rotor. Uh, we've got the Impulse 2, of course, and a standard Windows laptop. Uh, this laptop is running on uh, Windows 10, um, but earlier versions of Windows um, is still supported, but generally Windows 10 works very well with this kind of setup. Okay, guys, this is our new balancing mount. Uh, this is actually in development at the moment uh, at Dynex Hobby. It's a very solid mount, as I mentioned previously, you know, made out of uh, 6061 uh, aluminium. It's very solid. Uh, it's the kind of uh, mount that you want to use when you're balancing something at a higher precision. So I'll just uh, move around so you can see what it looks like. So you can see that our accelerometers are mounted on each plane. Uh, so that's looking at plane one there, I'm going to rotate around and you'll see the accelerometer for plane two mounted as well on the back. Now one thing to note is that when you're mounting accelerometers, um, the tails of the accelerometers should point in the same direction. Um, that's very important because that actually determines the orientation of the final balance solution. So on the dumbbell um, rotor, you can see there's actually a, a belt mounted in the center. That belt is connected to a drive motor down below, and that drive motor is um, powered by a brushless uh, speed controller and a battery. Uh, you'll notice that um, on the rotor itself, I've got a series of markings. Uh, you know, I've got <laughs> a few different markings here. I've got one at the top, one there, uh, a white one just there and also another um, black marker on the shaft. I use that to determine you know which one will give me a, a good signal for um, the infrared sensor or in this case the laser module. Um, that um, is actually our reference for the balance so that when you perform the balance um, the reference mark identifies you know where the, um, the correction weight should go relative to the shaft. Now installing the impulse is fairly straightforward um, with this setup. Uh, I've actually got this end closer to me is plane one and the one aft is plane two. Just simplicity, you can arrange it any way you like but uh, I find it easier if the one closer to me is plane one. So the accelerometer on plane one is connected to the XL number one port shown there and the black wire actually faces the label. On plane two, that accelerometer is mounted to XL number two and again the black wire is facing up towards the label and the laser module is connected to the infrared sensor port. Uh, next to the, um, the ports, you'll have a select switch, and we use that to select between planes one and two during the balance. So I'll just pan over. The Impulse 2 is connected to uh, a standard Windows laptop, and it's just any free USB port that you have available. So now I'm going to go ahead and start the Dynex Hobby software. So I click on the icon on my desktop click on the uh, warning. So the software has a new format with our new logo. Uh, the latest version that we have um, as a time of recording this video is version 6.7. So the software is broken up into three parts. We have the single plane, two plane and tools. Um, in this uh, tutorial today, I'm actually going to demonstrate the live two plane balance. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that. Okay. And so this window will appear, and I'll just minimize the main window at the back. So you'll see that um, uh, with a live two-plane balance, you have um, 
two sets of clocks on the left hand side and these I guess clock faces represent the uh, plane one and plane two of the, um, of the rotor. Now plane one is actually looking from the forward end of the rotor, so looking from that direction. Um, plane two is looking from the rear end. Okay, so I, I typically get questions as to orientation, so just recall that face is looking um, that way in the software and that face is um, plane two in the software. So now we can actually go and um, select our device. So we'll go to devices, select the microphone USB audio system, which is the Impulse 2, go OK and click Start. Now the very first thing to do is um, when you activate an Impulse is to let all the sensors rest and then click zero. And so what that does is it removes all the noise in the system and um, sets the, the readings to zero. So then we'll migrate over to the setup. Now for this particular um, test today, um, we're gonna have to identify the geometry of the rotor um, in order to perform the balance. Now, why is that so important? Well, the geometry actually helps identify, um, you know, the, the balance limits, I suppose, um, for the system. Alrighty. So, in the software, it actually asks you to measure the, the uh, distance between the two mounting bearings and then the distance between the two planes. So, with a, a rule, we can measure the distance between the bearings, between there and there and then also the distance between the um, balance planes. So it'll be there and there. And we enter that into the software um, to identify the size of the rotor. So I'm just gonna move this over and uh, just walk through the, uh, the entry for this form. So the rotor in today's test is gonna be spinning around 4200 RPM. Uh, the, the mass of the rotor itself is about 300 grams and the balance grade I'm going to use is about 2.5 2 um, which is about right for this kind of setup. Now as mentioned previously the, um, the bearing distances I measured them and they were 60 millimeters apart and the d distance between plane 1 and plane 2 was 80 millimeters so I'll put that in. Now the plane one mass radius um, is the distance from the center axis of the shaft to where you're going to be placing the uh, trial weight. So in this case it's going to be 28 millimeters from the center of the shaft to where I'm going to be placing the mass for plane one. And it happens to be the same for plane two and that's because the rotor in this case is symmetrical. So in terms of the spin direction, I get a lot of questions about this. Um, and the spin direction is relative um, to the, the actual laser module. So the laser module is facing essentially plane one at the moment. So if I was to spin the rotor now, very... so the rotor is spinning in a counterclockwise direction relative to the laser module. So that will be anti-clockwise in the software. So you'll see other play, um, windows pop up. Um, the signal tab is associated with the actual raw vibration signal. Um, we've got frequency as well for recording the frequencies coming from the main vibration signal. Uh, we have uh, um, another tab called cross correlation. That's more for, um, you know, it's a new method that we've introduced to identify the phase measurements um, in a noisy environment. But in this case today, we're gonna to be um, focusing on the traditional method, which is a trigger method. We've got a series of gauges as, as well, and the advanced tab. Now for this kind of um, balance, we can leave the vibration uh, factors as a default, as they are. Um, and that should be good enough for what we wanna do. Now, 
In terms of the corrective action, I'm going to add weight today rather than remove weight. It's a lot easier to add weight using um, blue tack or plasticine um, and see how the balance performs. Now the speed sensor I'm using is the infrared sensor or the laser module in this case, which is the same thing. And the phase method, um, as mentioned previously, is just the trigger. Um, and that works well for this kind of setup. So I'll go back to the live uh, window and you'll see um, in the live window you've got the live vibration um, vector and that's just essentially the magnitude of the vibration and also the phase of the vibration relative to the uh, reference marker on the shaft. Alrighty so the very first thing to do in the balance is to calibrate the system. Now what the calibration does is it actually builds a, a mathematical model of your balance setup. So it includes the things like the position of the sensors, um, the weight of the rotor, you know, the type of balance mount you have, all that kind of stuff um, gets taken into account. So the calibration really is training um, the impulse software or the platinum software um, to identify what a imbalance looks like in the system. Alrighty, so to carry out the um, calibration procedure, um, what I'm going to do is click on the calibrate button in the software and just cancel that. All right, so you're going to see a series of tabs. Um, there's an intro tab which describes the process and then you have tabs um, step one, two, three and then our final calibration factors. Uh, so in step one, actually ask you to um, measure the vibration um, of the system with no weights attached. So what we're going to do is we, um, we're going to spin the rotor at our uh, balancing speed. So I'm going to activate that. Make sure the impulse is um, selected to plane one. So the system's now ramping up, takes time for it to get to speed because it's a heavy rotor. So we let it ramp up um, and then once the um, dials start to uh, settle down, we'll take our reading for plane one. So just waiting for that to settle. All right, so I'm going to click on that reading for plane one, and now I'm going to switch the impulse to plane two. And when you switch to plane two, you notice that the um, the phase angle starts to shift, and that's because the imbalance on plane two is different to plane one. So it's what you would expect. So when when that settles, I will click on plane two and then I can slow the rotor down. I'm going to switch back to plane one. Right, so then I'll, I'll move to step two. Step two says to apply a trial weight uh, to the system. And the trial weight is used to um, uh, teach the impulse system um, on how to recognize you know, a mass in, in, on the rotor. So what I have is a, a dual of scale, it's quite a sensitive scale, um, its accuracy is 0 0.001. So I'm going to get a small piece of um, blue tack. So that's what I use for a lot of my trial weight, blue tack. Um, that's available in Australia. It's a very tacky sort of plasticine. So I'm going to turn the um, jeweler's balance on and I'm going to take a piece of blue tack and I'm going to place it on the scale. So this measures is around about 0.1. I might add a bit more. Okay, 0 0.16, 0 0.17 grams. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to enter that into the software. 0 0.17 grams. Okay, I'm going to take that off. Move that across there. 
Now I'm going to mount that piece of blue tack onto plane one. So I'm going to rotate uh, the rotor around until I see um, the markers and I'm going to mount the trial weight on plane one. Right now that trial weight is in line with the reference markers. In, a, in other words, it's actually at the zero degree angle location. So it goes zero degrees, 90, um, 180, 270, and then back to zero. Right, so now what I'm gonna do is run the system at um, the test RPM. Make sure that my impulse is set to plane one. Now I'm going to wait for the rotor to settle down. It is a heavy rotor and it takes some time for it to reach its speed. So it's slowly ramping up. Now you can see that the vibration um, vector um, is very stable in that location. Um, when it stabilizes, you know that your readings are uh, about right and it's time to take that re recording. So I'm gonna click on record plane one. I'm gonna switch the impulse now to plane two. And I'm gonna wait for the readings to settle down. Now in the software, as it's um, taking the measurement, it's doing uh, or performing an average um, calculation that average calculation really is to um, eliminate a lot of variability in the, um, in the measurements. So you can see that my RPM is getting a bit higher there. Um, there's a red mark that appears on the RPM target. I'm just going to slow down the system a little bit just so I can get the RPM in the right range. So that's about right there. I'm going to click on plane two. Right, now I'm going to ramp down the rotor and I'm going to switch to step three. Okay, I'm going to slow the rotor. Step three is taking the trial weight and applying it to plane two. So put it on plane two and it's in line with the marker from plane one. So it's in line at the zero degree position. So I'm gonna do that. Now what I'm gonna do is ramp up the system. So increase the speed, switch the impulse to back to plane one. So I can start my readings all over again. So the system's just ramping up now, approaching the right speed. Right. Record plane one, switch over to plane two. Okay, plane two. Take that reading. And ramp down. Switch over to plane one. So now I'm going to go to my calibration factors tab. Click on that and click on the calibrate button. Alrighty. So what you'll see is an initial solution um, for the balance um, and also a series of um, factors. Now these things are called the calibration coefficients and those coefficients are the mathematical model which defines your, your test setup. So I won't go too much detail into that. Um, I'll click on done. 
and what you'll find is those factors will now appear in the advanced tab under this section here. Now it's probably a good idea at this point is to save um, your setup. So I might call this um, two, Dynex Dumbbell Motor Driven 2, click on save. And what this does is it, sets up, it saves all your settings um, in a file. So you can actually open those settings at any time. Okay, so now we've calibrated the system. I'm gonna remove the trial weight on plane one. Put that aside. <clears throat> so now we're gonna actually run the, um, the rotor at speed and um, record the readings to perform the balance. So I'm gonna ramp up to my test speed. I'm uh, making sure that my plane one is selected. So I just allow the system to um, stabilize before I take readings. So I'm now going to record plane one. Go OK. Switch over to plane two. All right, now I'm going to stop the rotor. So you can see um, in the software that for uh, plane in one and two, the software uh, determines the, the balance solution required. In this case, you know, it's to add um, about half a gram uh, to plane one and about 0 0.042 grams to plane two. Uh, now that actually makes a lot of sense because when I was um, uh, running the, the rotor, by gently touching plane one, I could feel a lot of vibration, but plane two was very, very smooth. So this solution does make sense, and we're gonna apply that solution, run it again. Now, one thing to notice is that um, the quality um, limit for uh, plane one and plane two. So plane one has a very high value, and play, plane two very, uh, a much lower value compared to plane one. So what is the quality limit? Um, as I discussed in um, the single plane um, tutorial, the, um, the quality limit is essentially the theoretical um, offset of the mass of the plane relative to the shaft. So for example, if I had two grams um, of a residual mass of that plane relative to the center of rotation, which is say 10, milli 10 millimeters away, then my quality limit would be, or residual um, quality limit would be um, 20 gram millimeters. That 20 gram millimeters would be uh, what we call the residual imbalance. So what we wanna do is we wanna apply the balance weight so that residual imbalance gets closer and closer to the center of, of rotation. Um, as it gets closer and closer, that value um, for the quality limit will get smaller and smaller. So the quality limit that the software um, identifies for this particular rotor is around about 0.268 gram millimeters. Um, and so we wanna bring the values of um, plane one and plane two down to that level. So we're gonna go ahead and apply the, um, the masses at plane one and plane two and run the rotor again to see whether or not we are within um, a reasonable limit so again, I've got my jeweler scale. Um, I'm going to measure out my half a gram and 0 0.042 grams and apply it to um, the planes and see how we go. Okay, guys, I applied the, um, the correction weights to plane one and plane two, ran the solution again. Uh, so when I ran solution, um, I found that the, 
the uh, residual imbalance was still outside um, an acceptable limit. So I ran the solution again um, and got the new balance solution and applied it. In fact, I had to do that two times to get uh, an acceptable level. So in the software, you'll see that in the quality planes, um, they have both now turned green, which means that they're actually below the, um, the acceptable quality limit. Now, when I run the rotor, um, I can feel by touching the frames that it's, it's very smooth. So I know that the solution is working um, and it's correct. Uh, there is a bit of um, art to balancing. A lot of it is to do with um, fine tuning um, the position of the, the, the balance masses um, and also the location. Sometimes you have to tweak the location slightly, um, you know, left or right for example, just so that you can get the right sweet spot. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just show you um, what the final solution looks like. I'll just rotate around here. So on plane one, you can see I had a number of attempts um, on the rotor. So the first attempt was a large mass. This plane one was really out of balance. Um, the second solution was um, this location here, which is the second highest mass. And these smaller ones here and here is more to correct the error associated with these larger ones. So plane one was really um, badly balanced. Um, that was the key source of the vibration that I was getting. Plane two, just moving around here. You can see plane two um, only required two um, correction masses and these were small masses really to account for the fact that I had to add mass here um, and sometimes that is to do with coupling effects so an imbalance here will affect the balance on that plane and vice versa so they're both coupled or related together so um, there you have it guys that's the um, the two plane balance method um, takes a lot to get used to. Uh, there is a bit of work involved in trying to find, um, set up the, the procedure um, and get it working. All right, so there you have it. That's the uh, two-plane balance method. Um, a few things to note that um, sometimes when you try to balance and it's not working, it may not actually be an imbalance issue itself. There might be an issue related to um, the rotor itself. So for example, um, there may be a case where the, um, the rotor on plane one is actually misaligned to the shaft um, or the same uh, associated with plane two being misaligned to the shaft. Some misalignments are very difficult to, to get, um, get right. Um, and there may be other issues, for example, there might be a looseness between the connection between the, the rotor and the shaft as well. Um, if you're having difficulty in uh, obtaining the balance using the two plane method, uh, what you can do is lock one of the planes. So for example, um, I can lock the second plane here by actually restraining its movement from side to side so that if I lock that and that is allowed to oscillate, um, if I do that, then I can actually attempt to do a single plane balance on plane one. Once I get that right, I can lock plane one and try a balance solution for plane two. Sometimes that gets you out of a bit of trouble. Um, either way, I uh, hope you enjoyed our tutorial and if you have any questions, please um, uh, list them down below. Thank you.